Just a few basic requests. Can we request everyone to put their mobile phones on silent, please? Evolve and grow. Let's begin this wonderful session by paying respects to our motherland. May I, all, may I request all of you to please stand up and we'll just play the national anthem. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. By bringing light into the auditorium, I would like to invite all the dignitaries for lighting the Samedia. Can I request Mr. Pereril from HP, Mr. Venki from ITC, Mr. Prakash Patel of Bhumi World, Mr. Heman Bhotika, Mr. Fred Poonawala, Dr. Anayat, Mr. Dev Nair, Ramesh Babu Kejriwal, and Mr. Fahim Akbotwala, please. Heman Bhai, please, will you please light the dia? It's all there. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Prince Summit has been an enduring brand over the last five editions. We have tried to bring knowledge, involvement, and growth with every edition of Prince Summit. We try and get you 
information which helps us, as we say, to value add, to evolve and grow. And for a short welcome speech, I would like to invite on stage the man who has been instrumental over the last five print summits, Mr. Fred Poonawala. Please, Fred. Hello. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, my dear printer friends, ladies and gentlemen. I welcome you all to the fifth edition of the Print Summit. Print Summit, the event, has become the jewel in the crown of the printing industry, even if I have to say so myself. Our past success have only pushed us to make Print Summit a better event the next year. It is the enthusiasm of its attendees that drive us to deliver you what we think is a better product. And we welcome your feedback because we want to serve you better. Today is a day to celebrate Printer's Day. And as usual, we bring you Print Summit. You may ask me why. Today is a day we put down our tools of the trade and come to the temple of learning such as this magnificent edifice of culture and learning, the NCPA. It's the best auditorium in the country. To learn, to share, to meet old friends and new ones too of the industry, and then to have a good time. Friends, I'd like to share with you my experience of a wonderful organization I attended and I'm now associated with called DScoop. DScoop is a digital sharing cooperative of HP Indigo users. Six years, six years ago, DScoop was formed from the latent need of users sharing their experiences in cutting edges world of digital printing. Learning new skills, sharing each other's successes was all part of the DScoop agenda. Vendors and suppliers supported DScoop and even HP found the tremendous value of DScoop in transforming the community of digital printers. Today, it's a robust organization with 4,500 members and a conference attended by more than 2,000 people last week in Orlando. So who, did, who attended? Was it only the owners? No. It was owners, managers, sales and marketing teams, technical people, procurement people, because they were suppliers, there were vendors, there were software solutions, everything was shown at the show. Vendors have a showcase, an opportunity to meet the right people, and the group is very, very focused. Seminars are multi-tracked across three days with subjects ranging from opportunities in Asia to technical, sem to technical seminars to conversion of business to new opportunities. Many surveys of the industry, trends, and future markets are also discussed. Publishing using digital is a new area which was very heavily discussed. Cross-media marketing, these are things we don't even know about, but they are the tools of the future. And they're surely going to affect us in the coming months and years. The reason I mention this to you is because we at Print Summit, too, want to create a community of continuous learning. We want to create a community of learning as well at Print Summit. And we need to have a continuous learning process, and I'd like to have your feedback of how we can do this. Why continuous? It's because of the rapid change in the industry. Meeting yearly may not be the only way to connect. I'd like to tell you a short story about Professor Einstein, who was, studying, who was teaching at the University of Princeton in the US many, many years ago. He was asked by some students in the corridors of, of Princeton, Sir, your question paper last year was exactly the same as the question paper this year. Einstein said, Das is correct. And why so, asked the student. Isn't that the wrong thing to do? Einstein said, It is true. 
that the questions were the same, but the answers to those questions today have changed. And that was the speed of quantum physics that was changing at the time. And that's the speed of which printing is changing at this time. So that's why we need to connect more often. I'd like to ask this audience with a show of hands, how many people have visited Print Summit in the previous years? Wow. Wow. And I'd like to also ask one more question. How many of you use Facebook? Show of hands. Wow, excellent. So maybe we can do something on Facebook with the community. I'd be doing injustice if I did not thank my most important contributors to the success of Print Summit. My core team, consisting of our president, Mr. Hemant Botika, Mr. Fahim Agbotwala, Mr. Dave Nair, Mr. Vishwanath Shetty, Mr. Iqbal Khirodawala, Mr. Amit Shah, Mr. Hari Gupta, Mr. Bimal Mehta, Mr. Firoz Reshamwala, the BMPA Secretariat, Mr. Prashant Shah, last but not the least, he's the rock and the rock star of the BMPA. I would like to thank our invaluable sponsors. Thank you, yeah, please give them a big hand. I'd like to thank our invaluable sponsors. HP Indigo for being the prime sponsor, ITC Papers, Boomi World Industrial Park, Advanced Graphic Systems, GMG Percept Solutions, Heidelberg India, Pratham Technologies, Sona Commercial, Print Week in India as our media partner, Navneet and Srinivas Paper. Please give them a big hand too. Without them, this function would not have been possible. A showcase of our, some of the products is available outside, so I'd encourage you to go and see them during your lunch and tea break. With these very few words, and those angry eyes from my friends about timing, I say thank you very much, and welcome to Print Summit. Thank you. Thank you. Fred, please stay back. Uh, let's begin our session, session with a cracker. Let's have the first lucky draw. Fred, if you don't mind, please. Can you just select a winner just now? Can I take my own? <laughs> no. What's the lucky prize? You Sorry? You can choose anyone. Anyone? Yeah. Okay. So, everybody ready? Srinivas Virkar, Kaleido Graphics. He's a good friend of mine, but I promise I didn't rig it. to come on stage, Amit Shah, to introduce our next speaker, our first speaker of the day. Thank you, Amit. Excuse me for a minute here. Iqbal will take it from here. Since Manoj Bhai is now here, Manoj Bhai, can I please request you to come on stage and give a short speech. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Manoj Mehta, President, All India Federation of Master Printers. Please give him a big hand. Good morning to all of you. Respected President of Bombay Master Printer Association, Mr. Eman Bhutika, past presidents of BMPA, and uh, today's speakers, ladies and gentlemen. There is a very profound quote by Friedrich 
NIST that says there is one thing one has to have, either a soul that is cheerful by nature or a soul made cheerful by work, love, art and knowledge. Now, I believe that we all have a soul that is cheerful by work, love and art because all of us here simply adore our business. So once again today, let us all enrich our souls by knowledge. Dear friends, I take this opportunity to welcome all of you to the fifth edition of Print Summit 2011, a knowledge seminar that endeavors to enrich the fellow printers by spreading gyan and know-how about various facets of printing. An event that Bombay Master Printer Association organizes each year to honor the father of printing, Johannes Gutenberg, by hoisting a flag. A colloquium that guides the printers towards growth by putting forth an ocean of opportunities that exist in the business. In fact, as the president of BMPA, I recall four years, five years back, I recall having initiated the print summit, must say that I'm glad to see the progress today. Friends, do you know that the current business scenario where the customer demands are ever escalating and the change is the only constant, what is the buzzword? It is sustainability. In today's competitive times, every decision is important. From the company, one sources is paper to the company, uh, from the technologies employed, and everything is important. Sustainability encompasses many issues that are tightly bound to printing. It includes details involved in recycling of paper, substrates, inks, toners, and all types of equipment. It is about working to ensure less waste, reusing rather than destroying and avoiding use of toxins, heavy metals, and limiting production of noxious gases. Equipment manufacturers and paper companies are making a point of addressing the environmental and sustainability issues and making them a part of the respective uh, ongoing corporate strategies. All recognize the entire supply chain of printing, the process from trees to press to mailbox to trash has historically been an anything that a, a green one. And that given the shadow of climatic changes, print enterprises must take the initiative and set an example for the customers and other companies. Print Summit 2011 will also address such issues and other topics that will induce a whole new thought process. Once again, let's assert in this very memorable day by putting our hands together for BMPA, for today's, for today's speakers and all noted industrial experts. I'm sure, do hope that it will be an enriching experience for everybody here. Thank you. God bless. Thank you, Manoj Bhai, for these encouraging words. Good morning, friends. Today, I'm going to introduce the first speaker, Dr. Anil Lamba. Dr. Anil Lamba is a practicing chartered accountant holding degree in commerce and law in doc doctor in taxation. He is a founder and director of Lancome School of Management, a renowned business school located in Pune. Director of Lancome Finance and Management Services Private Limited, a company providing financial services and consultancy. A trainer of international repute, he teaches extensively and his clients comprise several hundred large and medium corporations across different countries of the world. He is the author of the best-selling book, Romancing the Balance Sheet and Figure Out the World of Figures, a series of training videos on finance for non-finance person. He has also done pioneering work in distance education and e-learning. Dr. Lamba is a prolific writer and has contributed over a thousands articles to leading newspapers and magazines on topics ranging from finance to taxation, investments and company law. He is a finance financial literacy activist. He has conceptualized and is actively engaged in the implementation of finance, 
literacy for all a movement towards creating a financially intelligent india that has a 1 billion indians as a target audience ladies and gentlemen please welcome dr anil lamba this session is of 55 minutes and 5 minutes is reserved for the question and answer thank you very much good morning everybody sorry i have my little mic uh, thank you very much for inviting me once again to this print summit <clears throat> It was a pleasure to have come here last year and equally delighted to be here this year also. Uh, since the time, as usual, is very, very short, I must come straight down to my talk. You know, last year, I, we all know you are wonderful printers and you're doing a great job, but in order to continue to do a wonderful job, it is essential that all of you are financially strong also. I remember recently having a meeting with a very large company when the recession hit industry and we were discussing that you know this is a very large company about 45000 crores turnover and they said that you know profitability will take a hit during recession but recessions we know don't last forever but the trick is to be able to outlast the recession you must last till the recession lasts only then you can survive and I think these practices of good finance management in good days make you earn more and in tough days, it is only those organizations that practice good finance management that survive. So when I came here last year, I really didn't have an idea what to speak on in that short time, but I started something. Some of you who were here might recall. I had said that in my opinion, if I have to give you in a nutshell the essence of good finance management, it can probably be expressed in some two rules that I usually talk about. Uh, these are not standard rules, this is something that I have put together myself. And last time I had just about enough time to give you one of the two rules. So I thought it may not be a bad idea today if I share the second rule with you. Uh, I know it's a large audience, difficult to interact, but uh, uh, all of you, of course, are familiar with your balance sheets. How many of you are involved in making your own balance sheets? Very few. Somebody had, okay, very few hands are going up. Uh, but I hope you're all familiar with your balance sheets because everything in finance uh, revolves around an ability to read, appreciate, and read balance, uh, understand balance sheets. Folks, a typical balance sheet would look like this. Left-hand side, which is called left and right might change country to country, but one side shows you liabilities, the other side shows you assets. And very, very briefly speaking, left hand side in this balance sheet tells you where the organization got its money from, and the right hand side tells you what you did with the money. And I said, I'll give you two rules. One I've given last year, but I'm going to repeat it just to uh, recap. My conviction, folks, is if you make sure that you don't violate any of these two rules. I can promise you that most problems that others face on account of bad finance management, you will never face. And most problems that others face are only due to bad finance management. You might be aware that in this, it's an established fact that in this world, out of every 10 businesses that close down, more than nine close down on account of bad finance management. So it is critical that everybody practices good finance management. And according to me, if you don't understand anything about finance management except these two rules, you'll still be able to avoid most of the pitfalls that others get into. And these two rules were, which I mentioned last year also, that folks, you've got to recognize if the left-hand side of the balance sheet represents where the money has come from and the right-hand side tells you what you've done with the money. We have to all recognize, number one, that out of all the sources shown on the left-hand side, none of them are free. Money is not free. Money comes at a cost. But then on the other hand, what have you done with this money? You have acquired some fantastic assets as shown on the right-hand side. And these assets hopefully have an ability to earn. Sources, as shown on the left-hand side, have a cost attached to them. The utilization of money, as represented on the right-hand side, has an ability to earn associated with it. And the first 
fundamental rule of good finance management is that please make sure you don't ever invest your money without ensuring that what you can earn through this deployment of resources is at least equal to or preferably greater than the corresponding cost of sources. Now, this sounds very easy to say, but it's very, very uh, deep and, uh, but I've discussed this last year. And the second rule was that also don't forget, you must always remember that the sources shown on the left hand side, out of all these sources, none of them are gifts. They are shown under a heading called liability. And what does that mean? It means every person who has lent you the money today is also the person who is going to be standing outside your door sooner or later saying, can I have it back? And you have gone and deployed it on the right hand side and acquired some assets out of these, this money. But the lender is going to want it back, so how are you going to give it back? And therefore, rule number two says, invest your money in such a way that the assets will bring it back before the liabilities ask for it back. So in a nutshell, these two rules were, I am going to elaborate on the second rule today, but in a nutshell, these two rules are, rule number one says investment in assets must generate a return which is at least equal to the cost of capital. And rule number two says assets must bring an inflow before the liability is demand and outflow. I have always maintained that successful organizations stand on two pillars. Pillar number one, ability to generate profits. Wrong miscon uh, misconception amongst many people is that profits mean money. Folks, profits and money have got nothing to do with each other. It's absolutely possible that you make lots of profit and have no money which I think most entrepreneurs will associate with. And it is equally possible that you have lots of money and you still don't make profits. So the second pillar on which successful businesses stand is the ability to manage cash flow. And these two rules actually talk about that. The first rule talks about ability to generate profits, earn equal to or greater than the cost of capital. And the second rule talks about cash flow. Make sure the inflow happens before the outflow has to happen. So let us now understand the second rule. Your balance sheet may or may not look like this one, meaning in the balance sheet that I have depicted on the, depicted on the screen right now, we have shown four items on the left hand side, two items on the right hand side. Chances are the balance sheet that you make for yourselves may have four and two or it may have numerous figures on each side. Now tell me, if your balance sheet has many, many figures on each side, how is that balance sheet different from the one that I have been showing you? <coughs> Answer is, in that case, you are holding in your hands a raw balance sheet. But somebody hasn't bothered to club similar figures together. Or I am trying to tell you, every balance sheet can be made to look like this. Folks, if you wish to make sure you don't violate rule number two and, and incidentally explanation of rule number two can actually be retitled as a session on how to read a balance sheet. So in the process, I'm also going to tell you how to read your own balance sheet. If you wish to read a balance sheet, folks, make sure the balance sheet that you have looks like this. If it doesn't look like this, I suggest you make it look like this. What do I mean by that? Chances are, if you have many figures over here and I've clubbed them into four, you can do it yourself. What will come under capital? Owner's contribution in any way. For example, if you're a large organization, you might have equity capital and preference capital and so on. Frankly, if you wish to read balance sheets, try and reduce the details as much as possible. Somebody said God is in details, not while reading balance sheet. Printers, of course, are devil in the details, but that's a different, that's a distortion of the original <laughs> phrase. Uh, get away from details. If you have too many details in a balance sheet, it won't make sense. If you have a company, if you run your business as a company, then you'll probably have stuff like authorized capital, issued capital, subscribed capital, paid up capital. I suggest remember always the left hand side of the balance sheet represents sources. Any figure that doesn't represent a source, you ignore. You want to get away from details, right? So authorized, issued, subscribed, irrelevant. The only figure of interest to you is the paid up capital. Similarly, reserves represent the profits earned by the organization 
and retained in the business. Either you make profits and take it home or you leave behind in the business, the profit that is left behind appears as reserves, but reserves need not be one figure. There could be 20 kinds of reserves. Reserves means any kind of undistributed profit. You may transfer it to specific reserves or it may be in the form of general reserves, but if you see any figure on the liability side, that represents undistributed profit, club it into one figure. Another figure has to be long-term loans. You may have borrowed from numerous financial institutions, different, different banks, but as a reader of balance sheet, I don't want to know which bank has lent you the money. I want to know how much loan have you taken on a long-term basis. Accountants need to know who are the bankers because they need to issue checks of installments. But as a reader of balance sheet, I need one figure of long-term loan. When is a loan called long-term loan for this purpose? Any loan not to be repaid within a year is long-term. And if the liability will mature within a year, we will show it as current liability. Is it okay with everybody? Your balance sheet can eventually have four figures on the left-hand side. Similarly, right-hand side can be shrunk to two numbers. Your bigger assets in value, land, building, machinery, equipment, vehicles, computers, all that will go under a heading called fixed assets. And that money that you need for working capital purposes. Working capital typically represented by inventory the cash in hand required for day-to-day -day functioning, and the money blocked in receivables. You have spent the money, you have produced, you have supplied, and the customer hasn't yet paid you. You need the ability to invest in that also. So those items appear as current assets. Everyone quite okay so far? Uh, now, right-hand side of the balance sheet has two numbers, so I think let's make a truly balanced balance sheet. Let's reduce the left-hand side also to two numbers now. Can you help me do that? Uh, one immediate reaction very often is, let's club the first two and the last two. What do the first two represent? They are owner's contributions and the last two are borrowed sources. That's one way of doing it, but it's not going to help us read the balance sheet any better. So I suggest what you do is you club the first and the second and the third. Now what's common in the first three? They are all long-term sources of money. Share capital, <coughs> longest possible term. I don't know if you're aware, in a company, not only you don't pay back share capital, but you're not permitted to pay back share capital. So once it comes in, it's permanent. With a small exception that there is a provision called buyback of shares, which is still an exception, not the rule. Uh, reserves, once profits go to reserves, theoretically they can be distributed as dividend in the case, in case the company doesn't make profits in a certain year. But my experience is once profits go to reserves, they become almost as permanent as capital. In large organizations, if at all they are used, they used to give bonus shares. So where from this category, number two category, they jump to number one category. From an almost permanent state, they go into a totally permanent state. And item number three is long-term loan. The name says long-term, so it must be long-term. So the first and the second and the third, all three are long-term sources of money. Can I say this one, last item, is a short-term source? An item is classified as a current liability only if it has to be paid off within a year. So this is a short-term source. Folks, can I say fixed assets on the right-hand side is a long-term use of money? And can I say current assets is short-term? What is current assets? As I said, this is working capital. And you know, working capital can actually be depicted like a cycle. It's called the working capital cycle or the cash-to-cash -cash cycle. For a manufacturing company, a working capital cycle will be, today you got cash, and next day you use that cash and buy raw material so it can, gets converted into inventory. Then inventory goes into a production process and it becomes a finished product. Then when you find a customer for the product, it becomes receivable. And then when you collect money from the customer, it becomes cash again. This cycle is called the cash to cash cycle and one of the tricks of good finance management is your ability to shorten the cycle. To give you a quick example, imagine there are two organizations absolutely identical to each other. And both of them go to a bank, I need a, let's say, 100 crore or 100 million working capital loan. 
and the banker asked the first company, why do you want this loan? He says, you know, I have to buy, I have to maintain inventory. And the banker says, what kind of inventory would you like to maintain? This person says, it should never happen that I've got customers, I've got orders waiting on the shop floor and there is no material. So on the safe side, I'd like to maintain a working capital inventory of three months. And then when his product goes into a production cycle, he says, I am an international player, my end quality of my product has to be flawless and to make sure that my product is of the finest possible quality, I must spend at least one month to convert raw material to finished products. And when the product is ready, he says, today, those days are over, where when a customer used to come, I could afford to tell the customer, if you wish to buy from me, give me an order, give me an advance, collect your stuff a few months later. Today's customer expects finished goods displayed on a shelf and therefore I must maintain a finished goods inventory also. Sometimes nowadays even houses are bought off the shelf. And he says, I'll be a fool if I think I can tell my customers you want to buy, you pay me and then take it, otherwise go away. Chances are the customer will go away and he goes to my neighbor and the neighbor says, take it, no hurry, pay me after two months. Now, the neighbor is going to say two months, the only way I can get this customer to me, if I tell him, you can pay me after three months. So, folks, how long will his one cycle take? Eight months. How many cycles will he achieve in a year? One and a half. So, if he has invested 100 crores, he will probably generate a turnover of 150 crores. Now, he has got a neighbor, this guy, absolutely identical to him. This neighbor also goes to a bank, give me a 100 crore working capital loan. And the banker says, why do you want that? He says, I need to maintain inventory. And what kind of inventory would you like to maintain? Now, folks, one of the basic principles of finance is, if you have less, you are in trouble. Less money, less inventory, less whatever. And if you have more, you're probably in bigger trouble. And the trick, therefore, the name of the game is optimization. So this fellow understands, of course I need inventory, but he says, why three months? The amount of inventory I must maintain shouldn't, shouldn't be a figure that comes out of my hat. He says, to understand how much inventory I need, I'll probably do a sales forecast. Based on that, I will do a production forecast. Based on that, I will do an inventory need analysis. I will also have meetings with suppliers to see that I can reduce the lead time between placement of order and receipt of material. Ultimate intention being, you need to head towards just-in-time inventory. And he says, in the meantime, I think I can manage with a one-month inventory. When his inventory goes into production process, this fellow says, I am also an international player. I am, I am as aware of the need of quality as anybody else, but I don't agree that the longer the time taken to produce, the better the quality. I can probably cut down my production time from 30 days to 15 days and still make sure that I don't compromise on quality. So production time 15 days, finished goods inventory also he says I'll manage with 15 days. And when customers come to buy, this fellow says, I, I don't agree that the only yardstick used by customers to buy or not to buy is the period of credit. Customers look at so many more things. They look at my product quality, in certain cases packaging quality, pre-sales service, after-sales service. If need be, he says, I'll give a slight discount, but I will convince my customers to buy on a one-month credit. How long will his cycle take? Three months. How many cycles will he achieve in a year? Folks, two identical business people having similar investment in land building machine, borrowing the same amount of money. One, one person generates a turnover of 150 crores. The other one generates a turnover of 400 crores. And the neighbor doesn't understand how are we different. We are doing exactly the same thing. Why is this person so much more prosperous than I am? Answer is because this guy's finance management is better. But it doesn't matter for my discussion right now, whether you take three months or you take eight months. If money can come back within a year, we call it short-term use. So are we all in agreement that every balance sheet can be made to look like this? Folks, whether it is your own or tomorrow you want to read somebody else's balance sheet, you're planning to buy stocks and shares of that organization, whatever your reason be, if you pick up the balance sheet of an organization by applying a little bit of your mind, it is possible to reduce the left-hand side to two numbers and the right-hand side to two numbers. And if you are okay so far, if you are comfortable so far, I think you are now ready to read balance sheets. 
I suggest at the earliest opportunity, do this to as many balance sheets as you can. If you go on the net, you can download the balance sheet of any organization, especially a listed company. If you do this to even a hundred balance sheets, folks, you are going to discover that actually in this world, there are only three types of balance sheets. Whichever balance sheet you're trying to read, you will be able to recognize that balance sheet that this is either a type A balance sheet or a type B balance sheet or a type C balance sheet. There are only three types of balance sheets in this world. One of the things you must do at the earliest point of time is go back and check your own balance sheets and find out which type of balance sheet do you have, A or B or C. Which are these three types of balance sheets? Here they are. Type A looks like this. Type B looks like this. And type C looks like this. Right now your question would be, how can there be only three types of balance sheets? Mine looks very, very different. So what do I mean there are only three types of balance sheets? What is the characteristic of each of these three types? When will we call a balance sheet A, B or C? So folks, if you are watching these balance sheets vertically, please don't. See them horizontally. And then you will realize the numbers don't matter. When will you call a balance sheet type A? When whatever the figure against long term sources is the same against long term uses and whatever is against short term sources is the same against short term uses. It doesn't matter if it is 80-20 or 70-30 or 60-40. So long as if long term sources are 60, uses should be 60 and short term sources are 20, uses should be uh, 40 and 40. When will we call a balance sheet type B? When the long term sources happen to be greater than long term users and therefore short term sources are lesser than short term users. And in case long term sources are lesser than users and short term sources are more than users, we will call it type C. Do you all agree there cannot be a fourth type of a balance sheet? Now I would like to see by a show of hands, which balance sheet do you think is the healthiest. How many of you think A is the best? No one? One. How many of you think B is the best? How many of you think C is the best? Okay, in terms of popularity, it looks like B followed by C followed by A. I wish I, I, we could have a bit of interaction. I could ask you, why did you choose? Would any one person like to say, why did you, whoever said A, would like to tell me, why did you choose A? What do you like about it? Looks nice and balanced. <laughs> I just now said less is bad, more is worse. A seems to neither have less nor have more. Anyone from the B category, what did you like about B? Okay, let, let me make, yes please. But I just now said less is bad, more is worse. So you seem to have more. <laughs> and on the other hand, C also has more, but on the short term front. I, I have a sure. theory here that long term sources should be used for long term uh, investment. Only. Only. Hmm. If you use long term sources for short term, then you're going to create a unbalanced. What if you use short term for long term? So, you are in favor of A. I am in favor of A. Okay. Okay. Uh, anyone, one person who chose C? Okay. I, I want to be sure, you know, my balance sheets are two digit numbers and right hand side is frozen. So, it is easy to recognize which is A, B and C. Real life, you won't get this kind of balance sheet. So, I am going to show you a little more complicated one with bigger numbers. I want to be sure, will you still be able to recognize it as to be A, B or C? So, here are three more. And imagine half a dozen zeros after each number. <laughs> so, okay, which one is A, which one is B, which one is C? Second one is A, first one is C and last one is B, right? Not difficult? So, if you bring the numbers down to two to each, it is pretty easy to recognize. 
Okay, how do we describe company A? I think you, you said it well. How, how do we describe company A? How much long-term money do they have? 80. And how much is the long-term utilization? 80. Short-term money, 20. Utilization, 20. I think it's fair enough to say, as on the lines of what you said, that A seems to have used all the long-term assets have been funded from long-term sources and the short-term assets have been funded from short-term sources. A has used long-term funds for long-term purposes, short-term funds for short-term purposes. How do you describe B? How much long-term money do they have? 90. 90. And the utilization happens to be 80. All the long-term assets seem to have been purchased from long-term sources and they have a surplus of 10. On the short-term front, this organization seems to have a deficit. The money available is 10 and the utilization is 20. So how did they bridge the gap? Obviously, the extra of long term has been diverted for short term purposes. B can be described as an organization that has used a portion of long term funds for short term purposes. C is running short of money on the long term front. Money available is 70 and the utilization is 80, but they have extra in short term. So short term money seems to have been used for long term purposes. How many in favor of A? Number have increased. How many in favor of B? Number seems to have shrunk. How many in favor of C? I think more or less the same. Okay, now let's see. Unfortunately, due to time constraints, we don't have time to do more interactions. I'm going to come right down to the answers. Uh, folks, I gave you the second rule. What was the rule of good finance management? Rule number two. Rule number two said, always remember that your sources are liabilities, which means they have to be paid back sooner or later. And therefore, prudence has to be exercised when it comes to investing the money. Invest your liabilities, ask for it back. But we said, all right, if the liabilities have to be paid back, you also have to appreciate that some liabilities have to be paid back faster than others. And which liability has to be paid back fastest? The short term. So what, what we did was, which is the reason why we isolated the short term and we clubbed all the long term together. Now let's start with C. Who is going to come knocking on the doors of C saying, can I have my money back? 30. How much will C be expected to pay? 30, maybe 30 crores. And the rule says, when people come knocking on your doors, can I have my money back? For heaven's sake, make sure there are doors available to you on the right hand side where you can go knocking saying, can I have my money back so I can pay my creditors? And on the right hand side, which source will generate money in the short run? You all appreciate long term assets are never going to generate the money, contrary to perception. What are long term assets? The infrastructure that you have, the excellent equipment that all of you have installed in your places, you can't ever sell those items. You haven't bought them for sale, you bought them for use. And the only asset that's going to generate money in the short run is the short term asset. How will the short term asset generate money? Through the movement of the working capital cycle, every now and then cash is going to become cash. Now tell me in the short period, how much money can C generate? 20 crores. And how much does C have to pay? 30 crores. How are they going to pay, sir? When these assets, short term assets are insufficient to meet short term liabilities, it is then that organizations are forced to sell long term assets to meet short term liabilities. And folks, the day, when the day dawns that you have to sell your buildings and machinery and equipment in order to pay a short term creditor, to me that looks like the beginning of the end of that organization. I said in this world out of every 10 businesses that closed down, more than 9 closed down due to bad finance management. If you know of any such company that have shut down, pick up the last balance sheet before they close down, it will probably look like C. Or if you had monitored the balance sheet regularly, if you had made sure that your balance sheet does not become like C, it's in your hands, this, this organization would still be surviving. Unfortunately, more people, I asked you how many of you are involved in the making of your balance sheet, hardly a hand went up. 
you've got to be totally involved. You don't have to sit and make it yourselves. Accountants will make it, but you've got to be familiar with every figure of the balance sheet. Otherwise, when the business gets into trouble, you should not be the last one to know that we are in trouble. You should be able to read this writing on the wall. And you can only do that if you monitor your balance sheets and read them regularly. I was giving you an example when we did the session with you all of Subiksha. An organization which was growing so well, your keynote speaker today is Mr. Biani on similar lines of that. But Mr. Biani continues to do well, probably his finance management in addition to his other skills is very, very good. And Subiksha, excellent, very, very highly qualified people running it. The promoter was an IIT, IIM graduate. But finance management was weak. This excellent organization came crashing down. And the reasons for the demise can be traced precisely to the use of long -term, short term money for long term purposes. Of course, what I'm going to tell you in half an hour should be discussed for two, three, four hours for it to really make sense. But I hope I'm able to communicate the importance of what I'm saying. So folks, if C is out, what does that leave you with? That leaves you with A and B. Now, which is the best organization between the two? Let me give you the rule for a healthy company. Rule for a healthy company is I, totally on the lines of what you said. Healthy organizations will ensure that they will use the long-term funds for long-term purposes, short-term funds for short-term purposes. Who has done exactly that? A. So which is the best organization? A seems to be the best, but, but I'm going to contradict myself. A is no doubt better than C. But B is even better than A. Now, why am I saying that? How much money does A have to pay in the short period? Who is going to come knocking on the doors? They'll have to pay 20. And how much do they have in the form of short term assets? 20. Wonderful. Epitome of efficiency. But folks, you've got to remember, the 20 on the right hand side, what is its composition? What is it made up of? Three items typically, cash, receivables and inventory. Folks, so these are your raw material vendors and these guys, you went to them, bought something and said, you know, collect your money a couple of months later and two months later, these guys have come knocking on your doors. Can I have my money back? Can this organization use cash to pay them? Answer is of course, cash is readily available. Can this organization use receivables to pay them? For a moment, let's say yes, let's put them on an evil play, uh, even uh, plane. You are supposed to keep collecting money from receivables and you keep paying money to uh, payables. So this organization can use cash to pay creditors. This organization can use debtors to pay creditors. But can they use inventory to pay creditors? Whatever the business may be, if they are uh, in your line, packaging line. So what would this inventory be? Inventory must be of packaging material. And who are these guys? Left hand side. They are the ones who supplied that packaging material to you. So when I say use inventory to pay them, what does it mean? You went to these suppliers and said, give me material and collect your money next month. And next month when they came to ask for the money, you have to tell them, take your material back. You can't do that. And therefore, A will get into trouble. While the number seems to be balanced, but out of the 20 on the right, all the money cannot be used to pay. And folks, that brings me to a key accounting ratio. You know, these short term uses on the right hand side are called current assets and the short term sources on the left hand side are called current liabilities. And the ratio between current assets and current liabilities is called the current ratio. And the norm is healthy organizations will ensure that they will maintain a current ratio of minimum 2 is to 1, not minimum, let's say approximately 2 is to 1. How much is the current ratio of the first organization? 1 is to 1. The second one? 2 is to 1. The third organization? 1 is to 1 and a half. Now tell me, can B also get into trouble? How much does B have to pay in the short period? And how much do they have in the form of short term assets? Can B also get into trouble? It can, depending on the composition, if inventory cannot be used to pay the creditors, folks, 
then if B has to pay 10, you appreciate out of 20 on the right hand side, if you ignore inventory, then the remaining should be minimum 10 or the inventory of B should be maximum 10. That brings me to the second ratio. The first two over here, cash and receivables, cash and debtors are called liquid current assets or quick assets. And the inventory happens to be a non-liquid current asset. And folks, here the norm is, healthy organizations will make sure that they maintain a liquidity ratio. And liquidity ratio is the ratio of liquid assets to current liabilities of a minimum 1 is to 1. And if, if 2 is to 1 is good current ratio, what is better current ratio? Higher than 2 or lower than 2? Higher than 2. So, A has a ratio of 2.2 is to 1, B has a ratio of 1.5 is to 1, which is a better company? And how much is healthy liquid ratio? How much is healthier liquid ratio? Higher than 1? So, A has 0.9, B has 1.1, which is a better organization? Moral of the story? While current ratio should be 2 is to 1, liquid ratio should be 1 is to 1, Folks, I will any day back B, a combination where current ratio is below 2 is to 1, below the norm and liquid ratio is above the norm as compared to the first organization where current ratio is above and liquid is below. In other words, the first guy seems to be loaded with inventory, but his payables are 1, but the liquidity that he can generate is only 0.9, he will not be able to meet his commitments. And the second person can meet the commitments and probably is efficient on the inventory front. And what is the moral of this story? What do healthy organizations do? Healthy organizations will use long term funds for long term purposes, short term funds for short term purposes. Healthy organizations may use some long term funds for long short term purposes as done by B. But folks, never ever use, it is a recipe for disaster if you use short term funds for long term purposes. Is a then A would be okay. If you have no inventory, A would be okay, but you still would have a little cushion if you are like B. Do use, in fact, I will be very happy if your balance sheet on the left hand side has no short term sources. Use long term money for long term purposes and long term money for short term purposes, you can't go wrong. What do I mean? Folks, these rules apply as much in your personal life as in your business life. Do not ever use short term money for long term purposes. Do not, do not, is repayable in 6 months? Why not? It is a long term use. For a personal individual, buying a house is a long term use. So, what kind of period of repayment do they allow you? 10, 15, 20 years? What will happen if they give you a 6 month loan to buy the house? You will take the loan, you will buy the house, you will have to sell the house to repay the loan. So, do not ever use a credit card to buy a house. But you cannot go wrong if you use a long term, if you use long term sources, which is let us say your own money and buy a, a washing machine for yourself, you cannot go wrong. How about short term loans that do not have to be paid back? They do not call them short term. Short term means they have to be paid back within a year. <laughs> that is a contradiction in terms. <laughs> That unfortunately is classified as short term, but you, when you read a balance sheet, you should call it long term. You are obviously referring to a cash credit limit, which usually never gets paid back. So, some are theoretically shown as short term, but they actually. So, you, when you read it, go into the heart of the matter. Yeah, yeah, plenty. Oh, so I can carry on for a while. I was almost stopping. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, let me take you one step further now. You know, I have said right hand side of the balance sheet represents where the money has gone and where does money typically go? Into two areas, creation of infrastructure and supply of working capital. And I said working capital has got three components, inventory, debtors and cash. So, how much is the working capital of this organization on the screen? 30 crores. Uh, so far, I have told you working capital is represented by the current assets which happen to be 30. But you know, more appropriately, this should be called gross working capital and there is another terminology called net working capital. And the formula of net working capital is current assets 
less current liabilities. So how much is the net working capital of this organization? I, I want you to apply your minds and tell me what does it mean. This organization needed working capital of 30. Then how did the requirement of 30 shrink to 10? The formula seems to suggest when there are current liabilities in a balance sheet, the role played by current liabilities is it reduces your requirement of working capital. Does that make sense? Folks, you appreciate if this balance sheet had no current liabilities, then the gross working capital would have been 30 and net working capital would also have been 30. And if this figure was 25, because this is 20, net has become 10. What if current liabilities were 25? Net would have become 5. What if current liabilities were 30? This organization would not need any working capital to run its business. The formula seems to suggest higher the current liability, lower the requirement of working capital. Is that right? Now, I'd like to contradict this formula. I say it doesn't make sense to me. How can the presence of current liability reduce the requirement of working capital? Let me give you a justification why I'm saying this. And I want you to remember I'm wrong and this is right. I want you to think and tell me what's wrong in my reasoning. When I look at this balance sheet, it tells me on the right hand side, this organization requires in addition to 70 crores towards buying land, building plant, machine. It can't run its business if it runs out of money at that stage. After buying land building machine, it must have money so that it can buy inventory. It must have more money so that it can hold on to some money in cash because inflows from operations don't happen every day. There are credit periods to customers and so on, but expenses are on a daily basis. So you must have enough money to meet your day-to-day -day expenses. And of course, it is a fact that you go on spending, you go on manufacturing and these smart customers come to you, buy from you and they say, I'll pay you month, two months, three months later. You need the financial ability to keep on investing and sell it without asking for money to be paid upfront. So how much working capital does this organization need in addition to 70 crores? 30 crores. And when I look at the left hand side of the balance sheet, it tells me, this person has got people who are going to come knocking on his doors in the very, very near future saying, please return my 20 crores. So he needs 30 crores to buy current assets and he must have another 20 crores because when people say return my money, he should be able to pay it to them. So folks, my thinking is the requirement of working capital of this guy should be actually 50. So I'm trying to submit the formula of working capital should be current assets plus current liabilities, whereas I am told, Anil, that's not the way to look at it. The correct formula is current assets minus current liabilities. Current liabilities do not add to your requirement of working capital. They actually reduce your requirement of working capital. Any one person would like to express his thoughts. How is it that current liabilities? I think it should add, but how is it that they actually reduce? So what you're saying then is don't add it again. You, it's already an inherent part of 30. So fair enough, I won't make it 50. Then let's keep it at 30. But how does it become 10? Okay, let me give, oh yes, yes. You're paying your current liabilities using your current assets. But do you agree I need 70 to buy this? And I need 30 to invest over here? You're using the 30 to pay the 20, so you're remaining. Actually, the other way around. That's minus. It's the other way around. I'm using this too. Okay, yeah. folks, tell me how much money has this organization raised which is the liability side of the sources side of the balance sheet? Left hand side. How much money has he raised? 80. And how much money does this person need to run his business? He needs 100. He needs 70 to buy infrastructure, 30 for working capital. He has 80, requires 100. So what does he do? What he does is, out of 80, he invests 70 in, in working fixed assets. You're scaring me. Okay. How much is left with him? 10. And how much does he need totally? 30. Folks, he says I can manage with 10. And how are you going to manage with 10? He says the 10 that I have, I will invest. And for the remaining 20, if I can have smart customers who can come to me, buy from me, not pay me, in turn, he says I can also be smart. I can go to vendors, buy from them and I don't have to pay them. So what do current liabilities represent? 
current liabilities represent how much of your working capital you were able to procure without having to pay. So out of 30, if you are able to procure 20 without the need to pay, then for how much do you need to pay for? Pardon my speed, I am trying to meet the deadline given to me. So you need to pay for 10. What if there were vendors who said, take 25, no problem. Then how much money would you need to finance working capital of 30? 